Hi, everyone, and welcome. My name is Susan O'Sullivan, and I'm so happy that you're here to join us this evening for our cocktails with the curator in the, in the uh, dining room, and we're going to learn about the drunks dinner. And I'm going to be your moderator for the event, and um, your audio and video are turned off, but we would love it if you would entertain us with questions in the Q&A section. And um, please let us know if there's anything that you'd additionally like to hear Julie explain or talk about during this evening. And joining me is Julie DeVere, our Director of Muse Museum Collections and Curator. And Julie and I are enjoying our Hemingway daiquiris. Cheers. Cheers. And I'll let Julie take it away. Well, hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, you know, during all of uh, the shelter in place order, we've still been working towards our summer exhibit in the house, the um, rich soil exhibit of Christine May's beautiful work is already out in the garden. So there's, there's plenty to see, um, but we wanted to give you a chance to kind of look into the house during this time and see what you have to look forward to. Um, because we had a really exciting new exhibit program scheduled and we've just completed installation on schedule. Um, and part of it has been what you were just kind of hearing a little bit. Um, and it may have been a little, a little harder to hear across um, the video, but I hope that you enjoyed hearing Ida here in her gown behind me, um, give her opening Toastmaster speech that she gave at the Drunks Dinner and her sisters and uh, family friends are with her and the table is set for them. It's always fun to set the table for nearly 20 guests and kind of bring out um, all the silver and all of the, the, the French Limoges um, and really dress the table with wine and uh, even the, the wine vines that are decorating the table and the sideboard are from the Bourne Winery, um, which is in um, St. Helena. So just north of us, a couple of hours, and that was where the Bournes had their first, uh, the first kind of country estate. Um, they had purchased it in the 1870s. Um, Mr. Bourne's father purchased it for his wife, Sarah. And Madronio was a beautiful vineyard and lovely acreage. They raised animals. Um, she was quite well known for her horses, uh, but she also planted you know, more than 60 acres of grapes. And we know that Mr. Bourne himself owned over 610 acres of Napa Valley grapes. Um, I'm still doing research trying to track down exactly which tracts of land it was. Um, but we know from multiple records that, that he also owned in addition to his mother's um, uh, acreage. So wine was something that was very near and dear to them and really took quite a hard hit with prohibition. So when the 18th Amendment passed in 1919, that was only about two years after they had moved in here to Filoli. And 
you could still produce wine for personal consumption, which we're sure was a wonderful excuse to keep the 2,880 bottle wine cellar in Philoli's basement <laughs> full throughout that time. And we have many bottles and labels from uh, those early years that are included downstairs in the, the cellar. Um, and we know that they were you know, still producing and still storing and that especially at the end of the 19th century, William had been involved in a number of different major projects in the St. Helena area, including you know, their own wine production where they were selling their grapes. Um, they weren't making their own wine in the early years with Sarah's Madronio grapes. They were selling them and William really felt that the, the San Francisco wine market was not being um, fair. They really pushed constantly that the, the, the tonnage for grapes should be sold young and cheap and the, all of the growers really felt that if their wine was aged and had a chance to get a little maturity on it that they could get much higher values and it would be a much better quality of wine and so he started um, one of the largest construction projects the largest stone built winery in the country which was Greystone Cellars. If you go to St. Helena today it's the Culinary Institute of America building and it's a big beautiful beautiful stone built um, building and they've done about 15 million dollars worth of renovation and uh, seismic work on it but um, you still see the, the shell of the structure and it's only about three miles away from Madronio and Chase Cellars is still producing wine um, in part on 60 acres of Madronio's original vines. Um, they were replanted about 1903 because of Phloxera that hit. So the California wine market took a number of hits in those early years. Um, not only did prohibition hit them, but they had just about 15 years before kind of gotten over the, the louse that hit and attacked the vines and the rootstock of California's grapes and wiped out more than 10,000 acres of Napa Valley wines. And it wiped out even down here by us, um, there was a, about 3 million acres of of grapes growing um, across the Santa Clara Valley to our south that were all sort of hit. And there's only pockets of that grape stock um, that survived it up in the Saratoga Hills. You'll still find some 120 to 150 year old vines that are growing up there, but most of them had to be replanted. And the root stock, they had to find one that was resistant um, to the pest. And so they really had quite a difficult time trying to like replant, rebuild, and then 1919 happens, prohibition happens, that definitely hurt the wine industry. And it stretched for a very long time, I mean, until 1933, when the 21st Amendment was made repealing the 18th Amendment. So that's a little bit um, about their wine history that was happening and why prohibition may have been something that they had more than a joyous reason to celebrate the repeal of. <laughs> so then when they hold this party, it was 1933. And by this point, Ida, his sister, um, her lovely gown that she wore that evening is right behind my shoulder here. And her sister Maud is right next to her. Um, and they were often playing hostess for William and Agnes because by this point, by the late third or early 30s, um, they were both really struggling with health conditions. Not only had William suffered a number of strokes throughout the years, starting in you know, uh, the early 20s, and he was pretty much bed bound and required the full time care of his nursing staff. But by this point, Agnes herself was quite ill and was also suffering a lot of setbacks. Um, for a number of years, we had known that she had complications from diabetes and um, possible heart conditions. But I recently read an oral history from her grandson, Billy Vincent, and he was talking about the fact that, especially during those last few years, she was likely suffering from either Alzheimer's or dementia, and that she didn't recognize her grandson when he would come into the room and visit her. And so that's, that's something about Agnes that we're only kind of just exploring more of, but that's, all the more reason for these parties to be happening downstairs 
is that they often talked about the fact that the two of them upstairs in their rooms, you know, kind of locked, locked in that space, loved hearing laughter and music and people that they knew um, coming for visits. And you can imagine them sneaking off one at a time upstairs to have a private visit with them, that he loved his sisters, you know, getting to play hostess in the house and that the house was still alive and that people were coming and enjoying themselves. It was something that was clearly very important to them. And so he even, you know, you can, you can definitely tell a lot of William's sense of humor coming through. Um, the speech that you heard Ida give was actually written by his nephew. And his nephew was a wonderful poet. Um, and he lived up in St. Helena, and his name was Francis Born Hain. And he wrote not only her Toastmaster speech for the evening, where she talks about Mr. Woods is serving the table and almost sweet, delicious food is being cooked in the kitchen. But he then roasted every single one of the 20 guests. So an individual poem was written that was specifically about every guest and then a little favor. You can sort of see a few of the little favors behind me on the table. Um, each favor was meant to go with their poem. And it was again, a, a dig right at the attendee of the dinner. <laughs> so some of those were just really, um, really fun. So one of them, Ed Eyre, uh, he had a little, it was a figure of a youth uh, in his brewing clothes holding a bottle and he had even moving wires so that he would kind of dance back and forth. And his accompanying poem said, look here, I hold this figure in my hand, this image of myself when but a boy, I play about the streets of our fair city. Look, May, remember not the coat I wore, the very cut fashion of our day, when Will and I shot craps on Kearney Street, and Maud, dear Maud, remember not my step. Like this, so true and firm, it was ever, when I homeward turned from a night at dance. Oh, happy, happy days of bygone times, of baseball, bars, barmaids, and minor crimes. So he pulled together all these things and, and we actually, the reason that we know these poems were read was that there was typewritten copies of every single one of the poems um, that was dutifully saved and they live in our archive today. And they had little notations in pencil at the top that described what the favor were. And unfortunately for us, um, it was a professionally shot party. That's where these lovely ladies were captured um, on film. but. It also uh, shot the table, the decorations of the room, but it only shows 10 of the favors. No matter what angle you kind of look at, you really only can identify about 10 of them. So some of them, we'll, we'll never know what they look like um, unless they, they show up. Um, all of the favors on the table were recreated by the art committee for us um, in 2017 uh, during our centennial celebration, working from the historic photographs. But somewhere out in the world, these 20 favors might still exist. You never know. We've had stranger things come home to Philoli. Um, but the poems themselves were on this beautiful typewritten paper, um, along with a note to uh, Francis and um, a thank you for writing them. And we know that the invitation was made by Bella Warren. And we even know that she was sent a clipping from a magazine at the time that showed um, a political cartoon and the cartoon had all of the things that were being repealed that year and the notations about the party were basically keep the gentleman you know lounging in a chair and uh, keep the casks and stuff around him and so she redrew the cartoon editing out what didn't fit so that they would have this perfect thing to put on the invitation so if you came to the party that evening um, it would have been an eight eight o'clock dinner was when it started and they said it was repealed but not reformed and that Mr. and Mrs. Bourne being sober will not be present. So you were warned in advance that they were upstairs under medical care and wouldn't be drinking that evening. But then you, you could pause on your way into the dining room in the drawing room and there was a giant banner that hung above the door that said Mr. and Mrs. D. Prejean are not present. <laughs> so they really really tried to make it very fun and between you know, uh, cigars and cigarettes and dates and 
plenty of wine, and the poem talks about the fact that the goal was to drain William's uh, casks down in the cellar. It was really quite a, a boisterous and fun evening for everyone. Are we getting any questions, Susan? Everyone's enraptured. I would, I would <laughs> encourage anyone that has a question to offer it, but I, I would like to ask a couple. Do, yeah. you know, Julie, do we know, Julie, what was on the menu for dinner that evening? Things that we don't actually know. We don't know exactly what they cooked that night. Um, we know from Alma's cookbooks, um, you know, we know what she would often be making. And uh, it should be no surprise considering the time. There was a lot of um, aspects and multi-course dinners and this would have definitely been a multi-course dinner especially starting so late and you would have just kind of continued through the evening and um, all of the footmen and the butlers would have been on hand uh, everyone was dressed in their absolute finery the the gals behind me as you can kind of see are wearing these stunning gowns uh, from some of them as old as the 1880s um, this is two, two of his sisters, or three, three of his sisters, um, Ida, Maud, and May, and uh, they were wearing French couture. We actually have Maud's gown, uh, this one right above me. It's a pale, pale pink, and it's uh, silk, and it's so delicate that when you just look at it, it wants to shatter. Um, the dyes that they often used in these uh, silk chiffons were quite fragile and they made the silk quite delicate. Um, Ida's dress shows a lot about Ida. Um, Ida was the one sister who never married. She was, uh, she would have been called the spinster sister, I'm sure, by a few who would have dared, um, but she was the one who stayed and take, took care of their mother and she lived in San Francisco um, just around the corner from the Broadway Street uh, house. And she was, you know, early research is showing she was quite a notable suffragette in San Francisco, a very forward um, and making kind of history type of woman. And while her sisters are wearing gowns that at this point are almost 50 years old, even if they are French couture and are still amazing one of a kind gowns, but Ida is wearing this beautiful 30s, drop waist, the whole back is beaded in these big kind of uh, open falls of beadwork. It's white silk chiffon and um, with the, the belt and everything. She had a long, long, like four foot strand of pearls on um, that I would, I, I would adore putting on display um, <laughs> if I could figure out how to secure them, right? It's just amazing. And so you can tell even amongst her contemporaries and her sisters, um, she was different, and it's so it's it's no surprise that she was chosen to be the hostess for that evening's event. We do have more questions coming in, Julie. One that I wanted to ask as well, and that is, could you tell us a little bit more about the attendees? And did they did they spend the night? Did, were they all coming from the city? Did they have drivers that brought them home? Well, we, we know everyone who attended, again, because of their, not only are they in a historic photograph of the room, I bet I could grab a little photo to show you even. Um, we know who was in attendance, not only from their photograph, but also from their poems, um, and everyone was identified there. It's a lot of couples. Um, so Ida is one of the only ones that is by herself, um, except for one other gentleman, um, but they were not together. Um, so it's people like our um, second in command of the water company, Mr. and Mrs. Eastman are here and they were running Spring Valley Water Company for Mr. Bourne at the time. You also have um, Arthur Brown Jr. who was designing the garden uh, all throughout the 20s and a close family friend, him and his wife are here. Um, you have other business associates you also have each of his sisters and their husbands. Um, so the Bourne's brother-in-laws were also with them. Um, you have a couple other business associates from the city. Not a lot that would jump out at you that are well-known names um, necessarily, but when you start digging into them, they definitely 
all have ties to San Francisco High Society at the time. Uh, the sisters and their husbands would have clearly stayed the night. They would have stayed upstairs in one of the 10 family bedrooms. And they, they likely would have come down for longer than just the night. They would have stayed likely for a few days and checked in. We know that especially during the 30s, Ida would come and stay um, and, and help with the house uh, off and on coming down from San Francisco. Others would have been brought um, by their drivers showing up in the best cars available um, with their full chauffeurs and the chauffeurs would have been visiting with the Filoli chauffeurs um, where there was always two of them living on site. And so they would have been visiting with the staff as well and uh, they would have been picked up at the end of the evening, probably late into the evening and it's about a 22 minute uh, ride back to the city at that point. No traffic, I guess. So uh, not too many other cars in the road. So I have a few other questions that are kind of related to each other. Um, first of all, why was it called the Drunks Dinner? And what was, the, what was it about this dinner that was so special? Well, I think w considering how invested the family was in the wine market, um, you know, throughout, throughout those years, they continued um, to kind of put their money behind wine in a lot of, in a lot of ways. Um, they, this was the repeal of prohibition. So this means that instead of just kind of hoarding your own wine um, that you're using for personal consumption, uh, you're able to start selling it again. And we know that they had, you know, a pretty good collection of wine on site. Um, and we know that they continued to enjoy it during parties um, throughout those years. Um, I, we've often made jokes about, uh, you know, how much was being brought here. We know that it was being bottled on site as well, um, but not grown here, but always brought down. So we, we know that uh, this was a great, a great reason to celebrate, you know, especially during that time, uh, you know, with the crash happening in the like, 20s and everything else. Like it was really, it was an important time um, to have a reason to celebrate. And uh, this one is one of the, the most well-documented. We know that they, they had smaller parties from time to time, but this is sort of the, the last hurrah. I think everyone knew that Agnes was only going to get worse over the next three years. Um, and even, even Will used to talk about the fact that he hoped you know, she would kind of go first because he worried, he worried about her. Um, and she did about six months before he did. And so this was the last, the last big grand party that was sort of getting everyone together and they definitely made a, an event of it. We have a question, do you think, or do you know, was there live music playing? What kind? And was there dancing? Ooh. Well, we often know that they were uh, quite able and happy to get uh, musicians to come in. So it would not have surprised me um, if there was music being performed even next door in the drawing room, uh, which was noted a music room on many of the early blueprints. And they, they kept an 1890s Steinway piano in there, which had been um, Agnes's piano. And so it would not have surprised me if they had um, a piano player or a quartet. Um, Paderowski came out and played often. Um, we know from the guest book that they, they often had musicians play. And you know what I've never double checked is on the same day on uh, November 28th at 33, I haven't checked the guest book to see if there was any well-known musicians that checked in that night. Because there was often quite a lot of composers and musicians um, from the San Francisco music circles that came and had dinner here. And we know because they, they stick out like a sore thumb because they usually leave a little one or two inches of music next to their names. And so we know that major composers from all over the world, when they had opera um, or a large performance happening in San Francisco at the symphony, both of which the Bournes helped start and found and had boxes at, um, that they would often, as a patron, be able to have a private dinner and performance here at Hyloli. So it wouldn't have surprised me if there was music, but unfortunately there's no noted record of who might have been here that night. I have a few folks that are asking, and I know we have um, an image of it, or I don't know if we have an actual copy of it, but you'd read from the invitation. 
Um, yep. Do 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 you have an invitation to show or um, with the illustration on it that Bella Warren um, copied? Is it on the is it on the interpretation sign? It is. So I'm going to get a little heavy handed with the sign. Okay. <laughs> Don't tell Erica. <laughs> so this is the invitation. And you can kind of see that political cartoon of the gentleman uh, lounging there. And you can see it was all hand, hand lettered. And here's the picture of the sisters uh, in the drawing room in their beautiful gowns. And we know where almost all of these gowns are at the moment. Uh, we have two of them on site um, on loan from the Bourne family, including Ida and Maud's gown. And then their sister uh, May's gown is actually in the California National Park or the California State Park collection. Um, so that one is currently housed in Sacramento. And then uh, we don't know where Mrs. Eastman's gown is. She was a family friend who was there that evening, but I can show you on another interpretive sign in the room <laughs> what the dinner party looked like. So here's everyone seated around the table and Ida is, is right here at the bottom at the head of the table close to the, the butler's pantry. And her sister um, Maud is right over here in her pink gown next to her husband. And their other sister is across on the other side of the table. And so everyone was dressed in their finery um, and really all the men are in full tails and tucks and they just look fantastic. Um, and everyone really treated this as a, a grand affair. I have a question. Do you know, um, was Bella Warren in attendance? And I think maybe it would be, it would be interesting, Julie, for you to just tell us a little bit about Bella Warren and her, um, her story. Not oh. everyone might not, everyone might not know. So uh, Isabella, Bella Warren, uh, was one of the Warren sisters. Uh, she was a well-known horticulturalist in the area. She was a florist and a plant broker. And her sisters had a shop. They were, uh, all the sisters were the children of their father, who was a well-known uh, plant expert in the region. And they started their own floral shop called the Sisters Warren in San Francisco. And they're really uh, quite recognized for their floral design influence in the region of kind of creating a naturalistic, beautiful arrangement style. And they were, Bella especially, was um, a family friend of the Bournes for many, many years. We have a lot of correspondence between Bella and the Bournes. Um, she was the plant broker who worked with Bruce Porter on the design of Philoli's Gardens. So between 1917 and about 1929, she was working with him. Um, and then Porter sort of leaves the project. There may have been some sort of falling out. Um, there's hint that there was some sort of falling out. But she takes over uh, plant selection and color, especially. So if, if you're you know, familiar with the Philoli Gardens, you know that it has this transition from one beautiful color to the next. And as the seasons drift from one to the other, you get this kind of profusion and, and cyclical nature of the colors. And so some areas of the garden can rotate whole color schemes three or four times a year. And so Bella was the one who established that sort of patterning. And she would source major plant specimens. Um, and she was quite well known for this in the area. She also did this for Hearst Castle, working with Julia Morgan. Um, so she worked all over the area. And she was also the Bourne's go-to florist. So you often had, um, we, we have a letter in the archive that says from Will that says, you know, Bella, I need 20 plus, you know, Christmas wreaths made and sent to this list of business associates, um, you know, with a card that it's season's greetings from Agnes and, and William, you know, and uh, he, he, he treats her very much like a beloved sister. And he often tells her that uh, you haven't invoiced me for that last group of projects that I had you do. I think you should let me take over your bookkeeping <laughs> because I could make you more money. If you're not coming after me for money, knowing that I can pay you, you must be losing money <laughs> to these other people. 
And so she worked on the Philoli Gardens throughout. Um, she, she sort of managed the color and the seasonal selection for many, many years. And then when the Roths bought, purchased the property in 1937, um, Bella had left and was no longer you know, coming for weekly visits. And one of the things that Mrs. Roth did, which I think was, was a really smart decision, was she wanted to learn how to care for the Philoli Garden from the very best. And she hired back Bella Warren to come back out to Philoli and to basically train her in how to care for this garden. And, and Mrs. Roth often said, Bella allowed me to think of the garden as my own. She, she, she taught me how to care for it. She taught me how to make the color selections. And she gave me the confidence to treat it like it was my own garden. Instead of something that was sort of someone else's that she was being a caretaker for, um, and, and they worked together on major projects like adding the pool and the pool pavilion in the 40s, um, which didn't exist originally. So they, you know, moved all those U's from the upper ULA down, um, put in a whole nother garden, raised hedge heights so that you wouldn't see that the pools are slightly offset from each other, which always really bothers me that they're offset. So they raised the hedge height of the sunken garden so that you wouldn't see it. Um, but I look at enough aerials of Philoli in the archives that it really bothers me that they're really not centered on each other. Um, but, you know, they, they worked together on projects like that. And, and Bella was here the week that she died. So she continued to come and help Mrs. Roth for the rest of her life. And she really loved getting to come to Philoli. And unfortunately, she was not a guest, um, but you can, you can imagine the beautiful centerpieces and the floral design in the room um, she would have done for them because that was that was her thing. And, and it looks like in the pictures that they went out and chopped down these ancient old gnarly vines. Um, and so what I did when we were recreating this was I drove to St. Helena and uh, I, I love going up there and visiting with Katie who is the current kind of she runs Chase Cellars and she's one of the Bourne family members. And Katie and I on a muddy, rainy morning in October were out in the vineyard and she let me fill the back of my car with these hundred year old Zinfandel vines that look like these like gnarled creatures. And she let me fill the whole back of my car with ones that had died. And then we wrapped silk wrapped wire, fake you know leaves and stuff onto them to bring them back to life because it looks like they just went out and cut a hundred year old vine to use as table decoration, which Katie will clearly not allow me to do. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm getting some questions about the wine that was served, or if you know the wine that was in their cellar or the wine that was being served during that period of time, was it red wine, white wine, both? Did they have champagne? According to the table setting, there would have been a white, a red, and champagne. Um, all three glasses were on the table. They were a lovely low coupe style of champagne. We know that uh, they were growing Zinfandel, Petit Syrah, Cabernet Sauvignon uh, is what the family was growing most often. Um, and we know that he also had very um, firm beliefs on wine. So with Greystone, you know, they basically treated Greystone like a, a wine bank. So when, when William decided that he wanted to create Greystone, it wasn't that it was just gonna be another wine cellar. It was really going to be a way for the grape growers to have their, their tonnage purchased and they would get cash in hand, but then they would bank it. And so they would store the wine, allow it to age, and then sell it to the San Francisco wine market at a proper price. <laughs> so by doing that, um, they had a very clear line that was on all of their early documentation that said, no Malvies, no mission or inferior grapes or any grapes in bad condition. So he definitely had a little wine snob in him. And uh, they could store, initially they said 576,000 gallons of wine at Greystone. And some say in time that grew to a million gallons. And, you know, he, he lets go of it um, before prohibition happened. Um, but still, you can imagine they're, they're drinking a lot of California Napa Valley wines, since that was so much of their roots. And we know that there was an awful lot of California Napa Valley wines down in the basement, as well as a lot of sherry. 
Sherry was very, very popular at the time. Uh, one question, and I think this, we just chose it because it was the right time period, but was there any kind of a Hemingway connection with the Bournes? Not that I'm aware of. So when we were, when we did the summer exhibit this year, you know, each room is a different decade and we tried to pull out activities happening on site um, that related to the arts. So whether or not it was music, drink, dancing, um, parties, um, musical performances that were happening, television coming into the house. You know, the Bournes originally on the blueprint had plans for a movie projection room to be built in what we call the Bill Roth Suite. Um, there was supposed to be a protrusion on the, the south, it would have been the west end of the ballroom where a movie projection screen was originally planned. And they didn't end up putting that in, but it was on the, one of the latest as-built that I could find. Um, so, you know, it was, it was sort of that last minute choice to not include it, it has a pencil mark through it, but it was in pretty, pretty close to finished drawings of the house. And so we know that they were entertaining, they were having opera, they were having quartets perform. Um, we know during the Roth era, you know, television came in. We know the Victrola was playing. We know that there was music and radio happening. So as you come through and you see the summer exhibit, you'll see and hear a lot of these sights and sounds happening, whether it's opera in the ballroom or the boogie woogie on the radio, which we'll hear next week in the kitchen. Um, and so we know that all of these things were sort of happening um, all at the same time, but uh, we, we don't always have the exact clues that I want. Well, so timely, someone just asked if you could describe the different decades that are represented in the different rooms this summer, please. So we have, um, it's the 1920s, uh, and it's an opera performance that's happening in the ballroom, and the, the lovely table decorations are high, almost two foot high silver trays with big over the top 1920s floral arrangements in them, which are absolutely lovely. And it looks like it's set for a private opera party um, to be hosted by the Bournes in the lovely room. Uh, we're really excited and, and I'll be hosting one of these, uh, these curator cocktail nights in the new gentleman's lounge, which most people will remember as the trophy room but we're starting a really wonderful, wonderful project in there that you'll learn more about soon. And so we're showing that as sort of the teens. Um, so when Mr. Bourne was still hosting high stakes poker games and uh, we might be looking at you know, a billiards table coming soon, you never know. So that's sort of the, the teens are happening in there. Um, it's the 1960s in the study and uh, we have a new television and a lot of soundscaping that's happening in there. Um, and so it's a, it's a lot of family cocktails and bridge parties and things like that happening. Um, it's the 20s in the library and it's again focused on what was the collection of library books that the, the Bournes had on site and, and why did they put in such an amazing library in the house. Um, it's the 1960s party uh, the debutante parties for the granddaughters of the Roths um, in the reception room. Uh, it's the 1920s, again, in the drawing room. Um, so it's, it's very much focused on music and piano playing happening in there. It's the 30s here in the dining room. And it's the 60s, again, uh, late 50s, early 60s, in the butler's pantry. And it is the 1940s, right in the middle of the war effort um, in the kitchen. And I'm really excited next week. Uh, I just installed it yesterday, our new refrigerator. Poor Susan, I've been showing her pictures across text message of, look at our cute new refrigerator and stocking it full of, of fake food. And um, we've done some lovely restoration work in there during the shelter in place. Um, so it was nice to be able to get some things done and, and visitors weren't having to necessarily smell the, the stain and shellac for almost a month um, that it took to off gas. So that was a nice project to be doing in there. Um, but we're really excited to kind of be wrapping up the restoration of the kitchen, which is, has been a multi-phase project over the last few years. And, and I have a, a few questions about the dining room itself. Um, are there any original furnishings in the dining room from the Bourne era? 
Yeah, there's actually quite a lot of original furnishings in the room. The table itself is a really beautiful pedestal table. Um, you almost never see the, the lovely, heavily ornate carved mahogany base, um, which is probably almost two feet in diameter in the middle pedestal. It's, it's beautifully carved, it's lovely. When you take out all the leaves, the dining table goes all the way down to a 50 inch ovoid. When it has all six leaves in it, it's a little over 12 feet in length, which is usually what you see it um, on display as. Uh, it's a very wide table. It's, um, it's over 65 inches wide, which is about 15 inches wider than a standard dining room table. So it is an absolute nightmare for finding historic linens that fit. <laughs> um, every time I find one, it's outrageously expensive. Um, but that is the original. Um, the, the beautiful sideboard with the inlaid green marble top um, is an original piece from the Born era. As is the rug that's usually on display in here. This is the Osborne House rug, which was uh, originally woven for Queen Victoria's Osborne House on the Isle of, of Fife. Um, and that's an original piece, which was, of course, originally in the library, but it was being walked on by daily visitors. And so it moved into here because this is the only other room other than the ballroom that is large enough to accommodate this 35 foot long rug. Um, <laughs> the, the table that's in the corner um, is, it used to be an original piece from the room, but it is currently in the library and where it was getting a little less uh, floral um, impact. Um, but the sideboard that's actually just here behind Mrs. Eastman um, is a Roth family piece that was actually Lily Matson's um, break front. And Mrs. Roth then inherited it and she brought it to Filoli and then she gave it to us um, as a part of her gift request. And right now, four of the chairs are from Filoli that just came back to us from Mrs. Coonan and um, her estate's bequest. And four of the other chairs um, of the low Queen Anne style chairs, uh, the Chippendale and Queen Anne backed mahogany chairs are from Mrs. Roth's bequest to us, which were originally from Filoli. Um, but the blue chairs are not. Um, the low arm chairs though are ones I stole from the reception room, which are original to the house. Those are born era and Mrs. Roth gave them to us. And then, of course, the Jan Wienick still life um, implements of the hunt and, and dead game over the fireplace mantle is a 1703 Dutch masterpiece. That's an original piece of artwork in the house that Mrs. Roth gave back to us, um, along with the uh, chandelier, which, believe it or not, she took with her when she moved out in the 70s, and she hung it in her house in Hillsborough, and she gave us the chandelier back in 1985. So quite a lot of the pieces in this room, including, of course, the Bourne Tiffany family silver service, which Mrs. Roth also gave back to us um, in, in 1985, are all original to the room. So the, the one big element that's, of course, missing was uh, there was a set of 12 quite high uh, needlework backed seats, including armchairs and armless uh, dining chairs. And it was an allegory of all 12 uh, months were beautifully needleworked into the design. And those unfortunately sold in the uh, Butterfield auction in 1975. And we don't know where they are out in the world. If anyone knows where they are, let me know so that I can beg for our orange chicken. <laughs> I have a few questions about the staff that were working during that period. Um, first of all, um, how many butlers or footmen would have been serving this dinner? How many staff supported the house during the 1930s? And who would have determined the menu? I think it would be great if you shared a little bit about um, the cook who, who yeah. you mentioned earlier. Well, we had um, probably around 30 to 35 staff at any given time, um, a little bit less after World War II, that number started to really heavily retract and uh, everyone gets a little bit older and does a little bit more um, after the war years. But census records and research that we've been doing the last few years, especially for last year's summer exhibit, Nest, we spent a lot of time digging into history. I spent a lot of time on Ancestry.com digging up um, people's histories because we only had about four really well-known staff members uh, through story. 
And now we have about 45 records upstairs that are really in depth. And then we know the first names only of maybe another 20 people um, now who we've either been able to identify or really uh, lock in on. And sometimes we've been able to receive through sites like Ancestry and things like that. I was able to reach out to Sidney Woods, who was our English butler during the Born era. I was able to reach out to his family and say, you know, I'm trying to do some additional research about, uh, about Mr. Woods. And they said, oh, he wrote an oral history about his life at Filoli. Do you have a copy of it? And I, I told them we did. And so we were able to, to get that. And it tells, he not only tells his story, but through that interview, he recorded a lot of other people. So he talked about, you know, what it was like to be a butler here. He was the head butler. We then had first butlers, second butlers, footmen, uh, pantry boys who were also helping. So you would have had the footmen that were helping here as well as the first and second butlers. And Mr. Woods would have been standing in the corner like he is in, in honor of the 1917 suit that's over there. Um, and so they would have been serving, you know, above and behind everyone at the table. Um, we know that one of the second butlers during this era was actually David Patterson, who later comes back to Philoli during the Roth era to become our head butler. But he had started as a pantry boy. He drops out of high school, becomes a, a, a pantry boy at Philoli as a teenager. And he says Mr. Woods gave him the opportunity to become a second butler when the twins, who had been the second butlers, one of them went somewhere else because he got a promotion to be a first butler at a different estate. And so he was able to move into that position. And then he was here until the 30s when, uh, when they both became sort of hospitalized upstairs. The staff shrunk in a little bit again at that point. And uh, that's when he went off and started working in other estates. And then later he managed uh, the officers club during the war years and then he comes back to Philoli to be a head butler and David was then here after we became a, a public property and he would still make house floral arrangements and, and do things like that and he told a lot of stories about what it was like to be here on site and, and how formal the borns were and how very prim and very proper um, but also very kind and generous and and that those were a little bit more somber and more serious years, but that they would love parties and they loved entertaining. But then he said the Roths, there was a lot more boisterous. They were a lot younger, you know, almost a generation younger. Um, and they had, you know, teenage children when they moved in. And so the debutante balls and all of those type of things were, were lively San Francisco high society, you know, location had to be Philoli. So you, you have a lot of formal staff in the kitchen, um, Alma Johnson was our Swedish cook, but we also had um, an English chef who really does not get any credit. <laughs> um, I, I, you have to be a dedicated Anglophile like Will Bourne was to hire an English cook, right? Because they're not typically known as, as being culinary masters at this time in the early 20th century. <laughs> Uh, there's a lot of jokes about English cooking at that point in, in time. And so it's, it's sort of funny that they've, they've hired um, an English chef, but Alma, who is the cook, gets all the credit. It's always her sweet smelling breads, her coffee flavored ice cream that get all of the credit from everyone. Um, and we actually, her son, um, one, of, one of the kitchen helpers was, an, was a great friend of Alma. And she wrote down all of Alma's recipes. And her son brought those recipes to us. And so we actually, are, we're still borrowing the book right now. We finished digitizing it um, so that we could record all of them for posterity. But it's all of her recipes. And she would often write notes in there about what she was cooking, what party, you know, what year. Um, so like at Christmas, we had her plum pudding recipe out on the table and that's what was being made in there. But these, these two Swedish gals were, were definitely uh, working hard in the kitchens and, and making all of these wonderful multi-course dinners. I, I love the story about Alma and the cookbook coming back. And I hope that you all, um, as our members, got to see some of those stories that we shared in the Philoli magazine um, that you're able to get. So we're, we're just about out of time. 
And I want to thank everyone who participated this evening. Um, this is an exclusive member benefit event. And um, we wanted to share this with you because we know not everyone is, um, is able to visit Philoli yet. And so we're trying to share as much as we can um, as, a, as a virtual Philoli experience. And so this is one of the virtual experiences that we're sharing with you. Um, another thing that you can do is um, visit our website and see there's videos that we've taken, um, tours of the garden. Um, there's virtual backgrounds that you can use. I'm not actually in the drawing room right now. I'm, um, I'm just using a virtual background and you can download these and use them for your Zoom meetings as well. We have all kinds of, of backgrounds for you to choose from. Um, and I also just want to, uh, to encourage you all to, to promote Philoli to your friends, ask them to become members. And if you're thinking of a gift that you wanna purchase for someone special, Father's Day is coming. Um, a, a membership to Philoli is always a perfect gift for everyone. So I wanna thank you all for being here. And I hope that we see you again soon, either virtually or at Philoli and take care. <laughs>